Ngoi et. That's what my family calls it, and it's what I know it as. But I've been told it's been called Ngoi chi by others. If you haven't had it, it's kind of hard to describe. It's kind of like a mochi, but not. It looks like a bigger green mochi, about the size of the palm of your hand, and it's filled with ground up roasted sesame seeds and peanuts with sugar. It was something my grandma used to make, typically in the springtime. The green color comes from the flowering plant mugwort, which my parents have been growing in their backyard for as long as I can remember. Pretty convenient whenever my mom wanted to make some. My mom got the recipe from my grandma, whose ngoi et was always a favorite among my family. Not many people make it, so homemade ones are hard to come by. Recently, my mom made some to bring to my grandma, but a cousin who was visiting from Los Angeles said it's been a long time since they had any. So my mom gave them the container she had brought for my grandma instead. It was not a problem, though. My grandma still had plenty from our last visit. Over the last few years, my mom has taken over the making of ngoyet for the family. She follows the same process I remember my grandma doing all those times before. First, she cooks down the mugwort leaves and mixes them with rice flour to create this sort of dough. It's not quite a dough; it's more of a big semi-tacky blob. Then she pulls small pieces from the blob and makes small blobs, kind of like cookies from cookie dough. But for ngoyet, these balls are not shaped and formed on a baking sheet. It's all done in your hand. Like my grandma before her, my mom grabs one small doughy ball and flattens it in her palm. She spoons the filling on top and wraps it all together. It never comes out quite the same as my grandma's version, but it's delicious nonetheless. Ngoi et has a warm, chewy texture with sweet, nutty, and herby flavors. But there are variations, like the one I saw online that was filled with red bean paste. This version comes from a food blog called The Walks of Life, like the Pan Walk. This site is a project of the Liang family, a family of four cooks who share their home-cooked and restaurant-style Chinese recipes. It started in 2013 by daughters Sarah and Caitlin after their parents relocated to Beijing. What began as a way to document food and travel evolved into a community centered around food and culture. What's really been valuable is the fact that the blog is a multi generational project. That it is, you know, my parents as well as us, and that amongst the four of us, we all have a very different experience of being Chinese American. The Walks of Life not only offers recipes but also helpful information on holidays and guidance for traditional ceremonies. And last year, the family published a cookbook called *The Walks of Life: Recipes to Know and Love from a Chinese American Family*. To me, *The Walks of Life* represents more than food. It's about sharing stories of family and tradition, and is why I reached out to Sarah and Caitlin, the daughters behind the project, to learn more. Here's our conversation. I wanted to talk about *The Walks of Life*, and could you explain kind of like the project and how it came to be? Yeah, absolutely. So, the Walks of Life is an online food blog. It's a recipe blog that we, Sarah and Caitlin, run with our parents, Bill and Judy.、Um, and it really came about、uh, in 2013 when my parents moved to China、uh, for a temporary work assignment. And Caitlin and I realized at that point that while we really loved to cook and had been cooking for years, we didn't know how to make many of the dishes that our parents made for us growing up. And that we had maybe taken those dishes and those recipes for granted, and so we started the blog as a way to record our family recipes and also stay connected while we were in on two separate continents. And it's since then grown into this the blog that it is today, which has like a really big, great community online of people who are interested in Chinese cooking as well as our other recipes. You know, we cover. Non-Chinese recipes as well. It's really anything that our family loves and wants to record for the future. And yeah, we recently published a cookbook in November of last year, and it's been really exciting to、uh, get out and meet readers over the course of promoting the book. And yeah, I don't know, Caitlin, do you have anything to add? I would just add the title of the cookbook. <laughs>、um, our cookbook is called "The Walks of Life: Recipes to Know and Love from a Chinese American Family." Yeah, I saw that you were on the West Coast recently, and how was that part of your book tour? 
Yeah, I mean, it was fantastic. I think as a family and as individuals, we've spent time on the West Coast, mostly for like, you know, vacations to see like national parks out there and like all the beautiful scenery. But it was great to to spend some time connecting with with readers because, you know, we have family out there, but we've we've never really, you know, had a chance to meet walks of life fans, I guess. Um, so, yeah, I think just like hearing the stories and, and hearing, you know, all the, the the fact that people had so many shared experiences as us in spite of the fact that it's like different coasts and different sort of, you know, I think we, we've discovered over the years that there's like little different like regional flavors of, of Chinese cooking that exist across America. So, you know, I think it's still nice to see that there's a lot of obviously like ties that bind still. There's a super vibrant Asian community out there, like Asian American community on the West Coast. And I think in New York, it's more, we're more used to like, there's little, not little, but like enclaves of Asian Americans, like in New York City and in like pockets of New Jersey. And our grandma lives in Queens, or there's like definitely an enclave of Asian Americans. But I think in the West Coast, it seemed like more distributed, which for us was like kind of weirdly exciting, I guess, to see and kind of different actually, because I think we're so used to operating with that, like whether we're consciously or subconsciously that like enclave sort of mode where we're like, oh, okay, now we're going into Chinatown, New York. And that's sort of where like more Asians will be. And then the rest of the time, it's just the presence is not as felt or something. Oh, I get that. I went to New York for the first time like last year and I, I get what you mean, kind of like these concentrated pockets of Asian communities. So they're not quite as dispersed, I guess you would kind of say that it is on the West Coast. What were some of the shared experiences you had with um, readers and fans that they mentioned? I think it was exciting. Like some that come to mind for me are one girl uh, was like, oh, you know, I... I discovered you guys in college and she, I asked her when she graduated, it wasn't that long ago. So I think she kind of had a similar experience of us of, she went off to college. She wasn't with her parents. She didn't know how to cook the food that she wanted to eat and then discovered our blog, which was super exciting because that's ultimately why, you know, we started the blog. I think actually, surprisingly, people our parents' age having sort of similar experiences of their childhoods and growing up with immigrant parents and having this weird sense of like wanting to assimilate and then sort of like forgetting the things that aspects about their like Chinese culture and the food that they, uh, that their parents cooked for them and then kind of coming back to it as adults and having the blog as a way to say like, Oh, okay. Like now I have all this information here that I can sort of reacquaint myself. I have another one, another young woman who came up to us and mentioned that her husband was not Chinese, but that he loved cooking from the blog and that it was a a way of connecting with like her parents and her family, like his love of like cooking Chinese recipes really helped them as a couple like feel more connected to her family, um, which I thought was really, really nice. I got married two years ago, and and my husband is also not Chinese, but he regularly cooks recipes off the blog for dinner on weeknights and is sort of part of our, like, all-hands-on-deck culture when we are cooking um, as a family. So that was really great to hear as well. Well, it's fun to hear that kind of stuff from you, too, just because my parents are cooks, um, so I kind of have a little knowledge background for some of this stuff. How do you feel like this project has connected you with your parents? Because I feel like I, I've i never cooked with them before, my own parents. Yeah. I mean, we did grow up cooking with our parents. When we were kids, they taught us to appreciate food and to really how to eat. Um, you know, they taught us what tastes good and that you should really put effort into your meals because they're important. But I think that over the course of working on this blog together, it's been a really interesting way and reason to get to know our parents as more as people. Like working on this project together, it's like not only are we family, but then we're also coworkers. We're also in the course of writing the cookbook. You know, we did, we wrote a lot of essays and we shared a lot of 
family stories and to be able to have those conversations with our parents and really get to know more about their childhoods and more about their lived experience with food in their formative years was really a gift, uh, something that you don't necessarily think about or that you don't necessarily have reason to go into when you're just sort of sitting around the table eating dinner or something. So that's been really great. And I think that they feel, I've I've heard from my mom before that she says she feels like this weight has been lifted, this weight of like the torch passing thing, like where she's like, I've passed the torch on, I've done my job. My girls know how to cook these dishes. They're going to be able to pass them on to their kids as well. They've said that before where they're just like, yeah, we feel relieved, I guess, that that they've done that work. Your family has documented things like the tea ceremony for Sarah's wedding, um, postpartum recipes and things like that, which I feel like is definitely part of our culture and heritage for a lot of these things that aren't really documented too much. I have my parents to go to, but it's that kind of collection of instructions verbally and then you can't like catch everything so that's I found that really cool to have yeah I think um over the past few years in particular we've been sort of working on more of these cultural posts the things like the tea ceremony things like other Chinese holidays other than Chinese New Year that are maybe less talked about like Qingming, like the Tomb Sweeping Festival, or like the Mid-Autumn Festival, or the Lantern Festival. And I think those are things that we as kids also had kind of like a tacit or like vague connection to. It's like, okay, we like know that we kind of do certain things like for Dragon Boat Festival, like Zongzi, or like the sticky rice bundles, those would show up and you know, that's really it. Like, that's our only connection to it. Like, we're not really sure what this holiday is. We're not sure why we're eating this particular food at this time of year. And, you know, we would get questions as we built the blog over the years. We would get questions from readers about certain holidays and like, what are we supposed to do? And I think that we took, well, we we took that feedback, but then also realized like, yeah, we would like to understand what these holidays are about and how to celebrate them and keeping those traditions alive. Because I think that holidays in particular are these sort of like places in the year or times in the year when traditions come out and traditions are, you know, kept alive year after year. And yeah, the older we get, I think the more we realize the importance of that. And with the tea ceremony, sometimes it coincides with like personal milestones. Like my wedding, we realize like, oh, do we know all the rules and the guidelines around a tea ceremony? We started like asking, you know, elders, my grandparents' generation, like, yeah, what do you do? Things as minute as like how you hand the tea over, like it has to be two hands. And how do you address each person that you are giving the tea to? Like what order are you giving the tea to your family members? Really intricate details that I think are important to that generation. And I think that what we try to do in those articles is say basically like these are this is traditional and like you can kind of take what you want from these traditions and like make your own traditions or like do what you feel comfortable with. Um, How do you feel that the blog and all the content you're creating has fit into, I guess, what it means to be like Chinese American or like, how is this tied into like our American experience? Because it's not just American and it's not just Chinese American. It's a big question. (laughs) I guess, I think in some ways I've been surprised at how I've returned to tradition and how I think as adults, we've leaned on tradition more than we probably ever thought that we would as kids. I've been surprised by some of the ways in which I've returned to those traditional ways of thinking. Like I think, for example, like something like, where am I going to live? Right. I feel like I'm one of those people who wants to stay close to home because I do feel like I should be close to my parents and I should help them when I can and see them more often and things like that. So stuff like that, I'm kind of like, oh, 
sort of sneaks up on me. (laughs) And I think that the blog has been this funny sort of re-education of what those traditions are and why that heritage is important. And I think as we've become sort of like firsthand documenters and preservers of that tradition, like I definitely feel like I have a better grip on the two sides, like the American and the Chinese side. And I think it's like a constant navigating based on your values and your priorities, like what from either side is like brought into the fold, so to speak, more than the other side. And like a good example is like the Chinese tea ceremony, the wedding tea ceremony. I was kind of the person who was tasked with like, you know, summarizing all the input from the aunts and the uncles and my parents and my grandparents and stuff. As I was writing that, I was like, you know, it's all like bride this, groom that. And then I was like, maybe we should be, you know, having a note for LGBTQ couples of like, well, we're going to say bride and groom for the sake of clarity, but you should definitely feel free to adapt this for, you know, your weddings. We got a comment from a reader who was like, oh my God, like, thank you for saying that because like I'm currently navigating the situation and I wanted to do a tea ceremony, but I didn't really know how to do a tea ceremony. And obviously maybe talking with their elders is sort of about it as like a touchy thing. So how are we going to sort of bring this tradition forward without losing it, but make it suit where the younger generations are at? Yeah. And to kind of build on that and maybe zoom out a little bit on this idea of like the Chinese American experience. I think that what's really been valuable is the fact that the blog is a multi-generational project, that it is my parents as well as us. And that amongst the four of us, we all have a very different experience of being Chinese American. My mom came to the U.S. when she was 16. She was born in Shanghai, and my dad grew up in the Catskills. He was first-generation American-born. He grew up in a very, very tiny Chinese community in his town. Most of his friends were not Chinese, but his parents, they had a language barrier. They couldn't—their English wasn't the best— Um, And they worked really hard in the restaurant industry to support their family. And then for my sister and I, we had, you know, bits and pieces of both of those experiences that my parents had growing up. And but our experience likewise was extremely different from theirs. And so I think that coming at the blog from all of those different perspectives allows us to speak to, I mean, not only people who are Chinese American, but people who just have an interest in Chinese food because Chinese food is so interwoven in the American experience. There's some crazy statistic like there are more Chinese restaurants across America than there are McDonald's and KFC combined or something like that. So I think everybody has a connection with this food. Everybody can feel a sense of nostalgia when they look at some of these recipes and whether you are coming at it from an experience of like mom or grandma's or dad's or grandpa's home cooking or an experience of Chinese takeout or Chinese buffets or a regional Chinese restaurant. It's like we kind of have something for everybody because those were all pieces of our own American experience. Yeah, it's a funny, it's a funny thing talking about like the Chinese American identity, right? Because it's so diverse. And I think on the one hand, it's so important to have that sense of community and camaraderie. And there are many aspects that are shared as we've seen firsthand with the blog. But like Sarah's saying, like there's also so much difference and nuance, you know, within the Chinese American community that I think that it's been sort of our goal to at least do our part to unpack some of that and to acknowledge it and examine it and respect it a little bit. Like I think, for example, it's like, okay, what generation are you? That's like a huge factor. Then it's like, what province were your parents or your grandparents from? Another huge factor. Where in the U.S. do you live? Another huge factor. (laughs) It's like, you know, there's so many layers that go into it. And then not to mention the fact that we're all individuals sort of like navigating this road on our own timeline and with our own sort of set of individual personalities and, you know, histories and things that we carry with us. So that's kind of the the mentality that we bring into the walks of life where it's like, you know, we're just going to try and like 
chip away at documenting the different facets of Chinese Americanness and like the Asian experience. And we try to do that through a few different lenses. And I think that people can discover themselves at their own pace. So that's kind of the beauty, I think, of the blog. Yeah, I think you put it wonderfully, because even amongst like the three of us, I feel like our experiences are so vast, but having that tie into our heritage and talking about holidays like Qingming and things and making it known help us all kind of connect together, even though we grow up in different places or have different regional differences, but ultimately like we can connect on those things. So do you feel like your American or Chinese American experience or American experience is kind of, it's its own varied but collective thing to like, if someone were to come up to you and like, are you an American? You would say yes. Or would you kind of have a hesitancy to claim the Chinese part in addition to that? I think that I'm American and I get frustrated when it's like, there's a, I should be able to choose whether I add an addendum or not. (laughs) Right. It's like, yes, I am proudly Chinese American. However, I can also just be proudly American period. Right. And I think that because of America's immigrant history, it is pretty common. And I think it is a point of pride for a lot of people to say like, oh, I'm Italian American or I'm, you know, Asian American, Chinese American, Indian American, right? Whichever. But I think often there's a big difference between whether it's claimed by you or like imposed on you. So I think at various points in my life, like I've experienced both and I, I just want the choice to be up to me. It's like nobody should make assumptions about the language that I speak or like how I identify, right? You know, the frustrating example is when you're walking down the street and somebody just says ni hao. I'm just like, what? You don't know me. <laughs> it literally happened to me yesterday. I was walking and there's a person and I smiled, you know, friendly, passing, you know, going in opposite directions. And then he said, (laughs) ni hao. And I was like, why? (laughs) Why? I was like, we could have had something so just simply pleasant. And then he had to go there. (laughs) (laughs) So I don't know if that answers your question. No, I I absolutely agree with that. It's like, it's something that I identify as Chinese American. I identify as American as well. And part of it kind of depends on where you are at any given moment, right? Like if you're here in the U.S. at home, I might kind of think I'm Chinese American. If I'm abroad, it's like, okay, I'm American. It's just one of those things where it's like by degrees of specificity, depending on where you are um, a little bit. But I also do think that, I really do value both sides and like the the Chinese American part of my identity. It has been such a surprisingly large part of my life. And now it's become, you know, our like life's work in a way. And so I'm definitely proud of that. And I feel like I do claim it. If somebody asks me how you identify, it's like, yeah, I'm a I'm a Chinese American and I'm a food person. And so like, I don't know, it's it's a tough question. And it's one of those things that um, for a lot of people who grew up in immigrant families that it took a while maybe to reconcile because you're, you know, you're at school and you're bringing your lunch and maybe your lunch isn't like a bologna sandwich or a turkey sandwich with chips and like a juice box. Maybe you have like leftovers from home and you pull them out and your classmates are like, what is that? And <laughs> it's one of those things where it's part of you. I mean, that, that that sort of feeling of feeling different in some way is part of you. But at the same time, as you grow up, you realize both sides of you are are valid. The culture that you're, you grew up in at home with maybe your grandparents, cooking certain foods or celebrating certain holidays or traditions, that part is as much part of you as the part of you that grew up watching American television and consuming American music and being American in America. So they're 
two, I don't want to say equal sides because that, that kind of makes it seem like they're separate. They're not. They're both in you. And I don't know. When I, when I think of, it's just such a hard question and it's a hard thing to put to words. Well, I think the fact that we're struggling to put into words just goes to show how much it is something that I think probably we could all agree that we're constantly grappling with. And that's why it's a worthwhile question to ask, even though it's a question that's often asked, right? Because it's like what Sarah said, depending on where you are, what you're doing, who you're talking to, it changes. And even like when just now when you were like, oh yeah, they're like equal parts of you. And then you were like, wait, it's not equal. Like, you know, it doesn't, it, it constantly is being navigated. And that's why people my parents' age still openly struggling with it, right? Like even in your 50s, sort of being like, man, how do I feel about all this, you know? And I think like, I don't know. I mean, I guess that's something we all do with our identities, period, (laughs) as we go on in life. It's just something that is ever-changing. I enjoy doing the like, temperature check periodically rather than the be all end all because I think when you try to take on sort of like this like this is who I am this is what I'm doing that's it I think that rigidity can also create an existential crisis too right it's a slippery slope to being like pigeonholed whether it's by yourself or by influence of somebody else or squarely by somebody else and I think the bottom line is for me is I don't want to be pigeonholed. It's as simple as that. I want the freedom to change my mind, to sort of evaluate on a regular basis. It's not a very clear cut answer, but that's what I feel about it. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm just thinking about this idea of like this constant negotiation of identity being fluid. And it's not like you're going through a process of like, oh, how Chinese am I today? Or like, how Chinese do I feel today? It's fluid like that. I think it's just nurturing different parts of yourself at different times, depending on what you're feeling and what's going on uh, in the world around you and, and all that. That was my conversation with Sarah and Caitlin Leon from The Walks of Life. You can find recipes and learn more about their family at thewalksoflife.com. That's spelled like the pan, W-O-K. They're also on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and YouTube. For more information on this episode and the series, head to pbsreno.org slash refugeesdaughter. And a special thank you to Sarah and Caitlin for joining the show. Subscribe to Refugees Daughter wherever you listen to podcasts and give the show a rating and review. I'm Christina Lee, and thanks for listening. This episode was written by Christina Lee with production help from Divergent Point Media. Refugee's Daughter is a presentation of PBS Reno.